while we have breath, while we have opportunities. Father, I pray that you just speak to us tonight about having this mindset, your mindset tonight. And Lord, I pray that you uh, not only challenge us, but Father, encourage us uh, to be united in this effort as born-again believers and as the church of God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, notice in our text this evening, verse number 8, that the verse, verse number 8, starts or begins with this word, the word finally, which indicates that whatever is to follow it is the last thought. Now, most of the time, this word finally is used at the very end of something, like a letter or maybe at the end of a broadcast. A radio broadcast, a television broadcast. Uh, it's even used at the end of sermons. Uh, uh, pastors will get up and say, finally, or in conclusion. Uh, so oftentimes it's used, but most often it's used to show that something is coming to an end. But there are times, however, when it is used in the middle to bring a thought to a close, but not necessarily to complete or to close out the entire letter, or to close out the entire broadcast. Well, we see an example of both of these uses for the word finally in our studies of Paul's prison letters. You may re remember back to uh, our study of the book of Philippians, and how that Paul, when he was in that Roman prison, and he wrote that letter to the church of Philippi, he wrote these words in Philippians 4, verse number 8. He wrote, Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think of these things. Now, he wrote this in chapter number four of this letter. As he's closing out this letter, as this letter is coming to an end, he used the word finally. But if you look back a chapter, in, in chapter number three, you find in the very first verse of chapter number three that he uses that word finally there as well. Now, it's not a contradiction. Uh, he's not the long-winded preacher that says, and just one more point, and just one more thing that I want to say. He was using it in chapter three, verse number one, because he was bringing a thought to a close. But he wasn't bringing the letter to a close. And so in chapter number 3, verse number 1, he wrote, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So there was a thought that he was emphasizing in the middle of this letter to the Philippian believers, and he was bringing that thought to a close. But after he brought that thought to a close, there were some more things he mentioned in chapter number 3, and then in the beginning of chapter number 4, and as he's wrapping up the entire letter in chapter 4, verse 8, he uses the word finally again. So we need to understand tonight, at the very beginning of this message, that this word is used in two different ways, to bring a letter to a close or to bring just simply a thought to a close. And that's exactly what Peter is doing here. In chapter number 3, verse number 8, when he writes, Finally, be ye all of one mind. He's not bringing his letter to a close, and we know this because all we have to do is look over a page, and we see that there's two more chapters to this letter. He still has chapter 4 and chapter 5, and, and I'm sure he's going to say things to these believers in those two chapters. I'm sure it's not just accolades and, and recognition of, uh, of other Christians and those who are serving God. He's going to have some thoughts to portray to them or to share with them. So this word finally here is bringing a thought to, the clo uh, to a close. But what thought is it? What's the thought that he is uh, sort of bringing to a conclusion at this point or at this juncture of the letter? Well, if we look back to chapter number 2, if you have your Bible still open, 1 Peter, look back to chapter number 2, and I want you to notice what he wrote in verses 11 and 12. In verse number 11, he wrote, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. So remember... That word beseech means to beg. And remember the title, that the two titles he uses here for them, strangers, those that are foreigners, and pilgrims. We talked about this during the song service. The fact that these believers, that we as believers, this place is not our home, that we're going to heaven. And so to, in this world's eyes, we are strangers and pilgrims. And that's how they should view us. And that's how we should view ourselves. He goes on to say, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Verse Number 12, having your conversation honest 
among the Gentiles. Now this was the focus of everything that Peter instructed them about from verse number 11 of this chapter all the way up to chapter number 3 and verse number 8. He is uh, focusing on them having a, an honest conversation. Now remember that word conversation in the Bible. It's not always referring to our speech, but it's referring to our manners, our behavior, our lifestyle, our testimony. And so here he, he begs and pleads with them as strangers or foreigners, as pilgrims, people just passing through, to have a conversation, a lifestyle that is honest among the Gentiles. For what purpose? Well, notice verse 12 once again. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So, his goal in these verses, from verse 11, chapter 2, to verse 8, uh, or verse 8 and 9 of chapter 3, was to encourage these believers to have an honest conversation so that those who were not believers, those who were unbelievers, might witness the actions of these Christians and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, let me remind you that we don't believe in this, uh, there was a push at one time, I don't know if it's necessarily out there today, but we don't believe that a Christian should be solely a lifestyle evangelist. There was a, a big push, a big uh, a movement about lifestyle evangelism, and how that uh, a person doesn't have to say anything to unbelievers in order to encourage them to get saved. We just have to live right, and then they'll get saved as a result. But the Bible teaches us that we're supposed to preach and teach, proclaim the good news of the gospel, but also live a righteous life. And so our walk is supposed to support our talk. And so we don't believe that a person just simply lives a right life and they don't say anything. They're, they're silent, mums the word about Christ. No, a Christian is to speak the truth. They're supposed to share the gospel, but they're supposed to live according to the gospel and live according to the word of God as well to support their words. Uh, another way to put it is that Peter wanted the walk of these believers to match their witness. By the way, tonight as Christians, that ought to be a challenge to us. That my walk ought to match my witness. By the way, on another side note, there's a lot of people who don't witness because they don't have a walk or they don't desire to have a walk. And that's why they don't witness. But as we've seen the last couple of Sunday mornings in the Sunday school hour, that we can't truly worship God without being a witness for him, without being a soul winner. And so that is the emphasis of this passage of Scripture. Everything that we have studied that Paul, or excuse me, Peter talked about here, about submitting ourselves to the ordinances of man, about submitting uh, ourselves as servants to our masters, our owners, our employers, uh, uh, submitting ourselves uh, as husbands and wives to our spouses in love. This has all been uh, uh, instructed by Peter so that these believers would have a walk that was right a testimony that was right, a conversation that was honest. And so when people looked at them, they would say, wow, look at these guys. These Christians in our region, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia, wherever they live, they'd say, wow, these guys who call themselves by Christ, they actually obey the law. You know, they actually are hard workers, and they do what the boss tells them to do. You know, they actually love their, their wife or, or uh, their wives love them. They have a good relationship with their spouse. Why, well, there's something different about them. Once again, if we think about it, everything that these believers were challenged to do, it is contrary to the nature of man. It is contrary to the society of mankind back in the first century as well as uh, the 21st century. As we know from situational comedies and from television shows, that people are encouraged to sort of slack off on the job. People are encouraged to break the law as long as there's not law enforcement around. People are encouraged to go ahead and, and, and not be faithful in their marriage relationship. I was in, uh, I think it was Lowe's the other day, or it might have been Walmart, 
I heard, I hate it when these stores play music over their intercom. It just bothers me. Because some of these songs, as you probably can understand, you can relate to because you heard them when you were lost. And then others, I remember I, I used to hear when I was in Bible college and I worked at a distribution center, O'Reilly's Distribution Center, and they just blared music all night throughout the warehouse. And we tried to get them to, to turn it off, just not have anything on, uh, but they wouldn't turn it off. And so we would hear these songs. And there was a song that came on that I heard in one of these two stores, and it was talking about, this guy was talking about his girlfriend and how that she had a halo on her bed every morning when he woke up and he wished he could take that halo and use it for the weekend to do something wrong, to have a one night stand with someone. I thought, what is wrong with us as a people that we would let our kids listen to this kind of garbage? But you know what? What's wrong with us as Christians that some of us do listen to that type of garbage? Now, maybe no one in here tonight listens to that, but there's a lot of people that claim to know Jesus Christ the Savior that listen to that type of stuff. And then they wonder why nobody in their family is getting saved. Because lost people, unbelievers, are looking for someone who's different, someone who's moral, someone who's upright, someone who's just, not someone who's arrogant and proud and, 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 and boastful, but someone who is humble and, and, and is trying to live a righteous. And that's why Peter said, you know what? I'm instructing you as pilgrims, as strangers, to subject yourselves to the government, to the ordinances of man, to subject yourselves to your masters, to subject yourselves to each other as husband and wife. Have a conversation that is honest. Now, with all that said, he bring, we come back to our text, verse number eight, and then he, he's closing out this thought about having a holy conversation or honest conversation, I should say. He says, finally, in conclusion, if you want to have an honest conversation that is going to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, be ye all of one mind. Now, the mind of the believer is mentioned often in Scripture. When it's referred to by the word like-minded or, or by the phrase of one mind, as it is here in verse number 8, the emphasis is on being united or being in one accord, like the first church in Jerusalem. An example of this is in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind. So when we see that phrase, of the same mind, in the same mind in the Bible, or we see the word like-minded. It's encouraging unity. So he says, ultimately, to these believers, these strangers, these pilgrims, he says, if you guys want to have an honest conversation, and you as a individuals, and you collectively as a church, want to have an influence in your region so that people get saved, then you guys have to be united. You have to have one mind or one mindset. Now, this type of instruction is not insinuating that every member of every church be exactly the same. After all, we're taught in the Bible, in the New Testament specifically, that the church is like a body. And that in that body, there are many members. On your body, you have fingers, you have toes, you have knees, you have elbows, you have a forehead, you have ears, you have eyes, you have a nose. You have all these different members, and they're all different, but they're working towards the same purpose. There is one mind that governs all of these things. When a person, when their mind no longer works, when they're in a vegetative state, that body no longer works. And tonight, I believe that many churches, I pray that our church isn't one of them, but only God knows for sure, but that many churches are not functioning properly, are not accomplishing what God wants them to accomplish because they're in a vegetative state, because some of the members are not being governed by that one mind that's supposed to be in control. That one mind is not the Pope and the Vatican. That one mind is not an organized uh, religion. That one mind is God Almighty in the form of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
that one mind or one mindset is God's mind. That's supposed to be the governing body over all of our lives and over all of our churches. Now, when we study the mind of God in the Bible, ultimately the conclu conclusion that we come to is that the mind of God or the mindset that God has is one of lowliness, which is humility, and it's one of service to others. In Romans 12, 16, the Bible says, Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estates. Be not wise in your own conceits. In our study of Philippians chapter number 2, remember what Paul said to the Philippians, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. What was that mindset that Christ had? In verse 6 he says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. So ultimately, the mind of God, the mind of Christ, the mind of the Holy Spirit, however you want to refer to it tonight, is a mindset of humility and service. But I want you to take your Bibles for a minute, hold your place here, and turn over there to that passage I just read to you in Philippians. Because I want you to see something here. Philippians chapter number 2, and we'll come back here to 1 Peter real briefly. For uh, three words I want to, to sort of leave you with concerning the mind of God. In Philippians chapter number 2, in verse 5, I read to you, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And there in verses 6, 7, and 8, we're told that the mind of God is a mind of service, a mind of uh, uh, humility, but I want you to notice verse number 2 now. Back up to verse number 2. And Paul here writes, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. That was one of those words I said, look for. It's just like saying of one mind or in the same mind. Be ye like-minded, or ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So here... The Bible tells us something about the mindset of God that goes along with humility and service. That the mindset of God or the mind of God is one of love. After all, we know that God is love. The Bible tells us that in the book of 1 John. His mind or mindset is one of love. We don't need to look any further, really, than probably the most well-known verse in all the Bible. And to the Romans wrote to come to that conclusion, John 3, 16, for God so loved. Romans 5, 8, and the Romans wrote, says, but God commended his love toward us. And that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the mindset or the mind of God is one of humility, it's one of service, but it's one of love. And really love is the motivating force behind serving. It's the motivating force behind humbling oneself to serve others because of love. Why did Jesus Christ leave heaven and come to earth? To uh, Why did he humble himself and, and come and serve us? Because of love. That was the motivating factor. And love is that motivating factor to serve even when your service is not appreciated by others. Every one of us has been in a position before where we served someone or serve people, and we didn't get a thank you. We didn't feel very appreciated. But we continue to serve. Because of our love, either for an individual who asked us to be involved, or because of our love for a, a cause that we stood for or stood with. Well, here, Peter encourages believers, these believers who are scattered throughout these five regions, to add to their mind of Humility and their mind of subjection or submission that he's mentioned three times here. Submit to the uh, authority over you in the form of the government. Submit to your masters. Submit to your spouse or su subject yourself to your spouse. And now he, he brings it to a close and he says, the motivating factor behind why you're going to humble yourself, behind why you're going to submit yourself to these three groups of people is because of love. He says, I have a mind of love. Now, a mind of love really can be summed up with three words. And if we look back to our text, I'll give you these three, three words real quickly here tonight. First off, we see that the mind of God 
and a mind of love is one of sympathy. It's one of sympathy. Notice, notice there in verse number eight, finally be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Notice that word compassion. Compassion is just that. It's sympathy. It's painful sim sympathy. It's suffering with another. Looking at a person, seeing their need and feeling for them, and empathizing with them. Sympathy. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ, our perfect example. How that it said he went through the towns and the villages, and then he looked out and he saw the multitudes, and he saw how that they were scattered as sheep having no shepherd, and he had compassion on them. He had sympathy on them. Remember the challenge in the, the book of Jude. Jude has no chapters to it, just a number of verses to it. And it says, enough, some having compassion, making a difference. Sympathy. Seeing a person's need, empathizing with it, having a, 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 a self, a suffering with that person, or putting yourself in their situation, in their shoes, and feeling for them, will ultimately help you to have a mind of love and to serve them, to subject yourself, even when people are not grateful, when people are not thankful. He says, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren. And then notice, going along with sympathy, he says, be pitiful. Now that word right there, pitiful, means the same thing really as compassion. To have sorrow for a person's situation and to see their need. It also means to have a heart that is distressed. When we look at the needs of others and we look at the situations of others, are we angered or are we distressed? Are we upset at them and upset with them, or are we burdened for them? He says, hey, you need to submit yourselves, Christians. You need to, in order to accomplish this, in order to be successful in this, you're going to have to have a mind of love. To have a mind of love, you're going to have to sympathize. You're going to have to be sympathetic. But then he, he mentions a second part to having a mind of love. He says that a mind of love is not just one of sympathy. But it's one of civility as well. In verse number 8, notice the very last phrase there, the last two words, be courteous. Be courteous. Courteous, of course, is referring to a person's manners, to them being polite, them being civil. So often people lose their civility. They forfeit their manners because of their emotions, because of their outrage. He says, you're going to see things. You're going to uh, uh, be subjected to people, and, 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 and they may not always be uh, good and honest. As he mentioned in verse number 18 of chapter number 2, he says to subject yourselves to masters, not only the good and gentle, but also to the forward, those that are unyielding, those that are wicked, those that are ungodly. He says, you may suffer wrongfully. And he says, but you still be civil. You still be courteous. Once again, it's not an easy thing to do, but all we have to do is look to our perfect example of Jesus Christ. And all we have to think back to his apprehension, his arrest, how he was treated unjustly through that entire trial and then through his crucifixion. And at no time did he curse those men. At no time did he uh, wish evil upon them. It's, in fact, his words were, uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Remember Stephen in the book of Acts, as he's being stoned. And, of course, Paul, at the time, who was known by the name of Saul, is standing there holding the clothes of those men who were picking up those stones. And remember, they would take their robe off and hand it to someone to hold it, so that way they could... They could cast the stone with all their force. And so these men took their robes off, handed them to Saul, who later became Paul, picked up these stones, and with all their might, hurled these stones at Stephen to kill him. 
And he wished the same thing for these men that Jesus wished upon his accusers and his, uh, his oppressors was that it not be laid to their charge. They were civil, even when civility in our eyes wasn't required. Because you see, we're not looking at it through our eyes. We're not supposed to be looking at it through our mindset, and with our mindset, we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. He says, have this mind, have the mind of God, every one of you. The mind of God is one of love, it's one of sympathy, it's one of civility. And then notice verse number 9. It's one of clemency. One of clemency. It's a word we don't use very often. Clemency. C-L-E-M-E-N-C-Y. But really, clemency is another word for mercy. He says, verse number nine, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. That knowing that ye are there to call, that ye should inherit a blessing. Clemency. It's a mildness of temper. It's a softness or gentleness that a person is supposed to have. This is a fruit of the Spirit that we've studied in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. When people curse you, don't curse them back. Instead, you bless them. Don't rail on them because they railed on you. Notice that instruction, verse number 9, knowing that ye are there unto call. We're called to be just like our Master Jesus Christ. Remember his words that a servant is not greater than his Lord. And as our Lord, as our Master, Christ made himself a servant, as we've already established in the message tonight. So tonight, we need to have a, a mind of love. Not a mind of vindictiveness. Not a mind of, I'll get you back. Vengeance is mine. No, vengeance is God's. We need to be a person who is loving, a person like God, who has love in our hearts and in our minds, for those around us. Once again, someone might say, well, that person, you don't know that person, preacher. That person doesn't deserve my love. Let me remind you what Romans 5, 8 says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. We didn't deserve his love either. We still don't deserve his love tonight. But he has exemplified it to us. He showed it to us, and he continues to show it to us every day. And that person may not be worthy of your love, but you show it to them anyway. Subject yourself to them. Because it may be through your submission. It may be through your subjection. It may be through your mind of love and your actions of love that that person is converted. Let me close with this real quickly. That a person being saved, although that's a, that's a great benefit to us as Christians who submit ourselves and purpose that we want to have the mind of Christ in our lives, that's not the only benefit to having the mind of Christ. In Romans 15 and verses 5 and 6, it says, Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. Verse 6 reads, That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. You know, as we have the mind of Christ, our Heavenly Father is glorified. As we unite in His mind, His mindset, He's glorified because ultimately... He is emulated. We're emulating him. And there's nothing that a father takes more or gets more glory out of than a child who emulates him. But not only that, the Bible tells us that as we have this mindset, as individuals, as we take on the mind of Christ, that our church will be strong. In Philippians 1.27 Paul wrote, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Pastor Paul Chapel, their printing ministry is called Striving Together Publications. You know how we strive as a church? You know how we stand and strive and go forward and, and see God bless and grow our ministry here? It's by being united, by being one, by having one mind. Not Pastor Miller's mind, not the treasurer's mind, not the nursery worker's mind. It's by having God's mind, every one of us having the mind of God. 
And then the last benefit is found in 2 Corinthians. Let me have you turn over there as we close tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 13 and verse number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 13 and verse number 11. And we see here Paul using that word finally. So we're going to close with it. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. The final benefit is to us personally. He says, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. While it's promised to us that God will never leave us or forsake us as believers, sometimes his presence and his power isn't felt by us. God doesn't wander away from us, but sometimes as Christians, when we don't have his mind, we wander away from him. And so we don't feel his presence and his power uh, strongly in our lives. But as we have the mind of God, his presence, his power is felt by us individually, and we know that God is right there with us. And that's what he meant here, by the God of love and peace shall be with you. You're going to be reminded that God is right there with you. As we close, it reminds me of probably the most famous psalm in the book of Psalms, Psalm 23, in verse number 4, where David, the shepherd, wrote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The greatest benefit to us individually as believers is that as we have the mind of God, we have the presence and power of God with us and upon us. Tonight, I don't know about you, but in the day and age in which we live, with all the things that are going on, I want the presence and power of God in my life. We need the presence and power of God in our country. And it's only going to happen if we as Christians, if we as believers, will not have the mind of the most popular person in church or the mind of the most uh, well-known Hollywood actor or political figure, but if we have the mind of God, the mind of love. Father, thank you for all that you've uh, given to us and, and shown to us tonight from your word. Lord, I pray that you help us now as we take just a, a few moments to reflect upon what we've studied. Father, as we reflect upon the requests that were mentioned earlier, Lord, I pray that you would help us to personally seek the mind of Christ, to ask for it daily. Father, we know that as a good father, that you give good gifts. Father, if we'll ask of it believing, that you'll give it to us. You'll help us to love the way that you love, which will help us to submit ourselves to others and serve others. Now, Father, I pray that we take a few moments here to submit ourselves and submit our time to praying for those that need it tonight. So many that are ailing, so many that are in spiritual need. Father, please bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we're just going to take a few minutes to pray. We're not going to have any music play tonight, but I do want to encourage you to go ahead and take a few moments to pray. I'll close this out here in just a minute. But maybe you can pray first about what we studied tonight. Maybe you personally were convicted about having the mind of Christ and loving those around you. Maybe you were challenged to be more subjective to your spouse, to your job and your employer, giving 100% while you're there.